What saith the Scriptures? I'm sure you know the verse well. John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever will believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a faithful and true witness of the love of God. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And surely there is no better representation than the, of the love of God. There is no better exemplification of the love of God. Except when God the Father, through the hands of sinful men, sovereignly presiding over the whole calculated design, crucified His own Son on a cross on behalf of wicked men. Orchestrating one single event where the wrath of God is absorbed into the bosom of a sinless and eternal person incarnated in human flesh. There's no greater representation than the love of God expressed in the death of His Son. Surely this is the meaning of the verse, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. But how many multitudes of people today superstitiously quote, preach, and believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All the while they know him not. First John chapter 2, verse 4 says, Those who say they know Him, that is Jesus, and keep not His commandments, are a liar, and the truth is not in them. Do you see, the objective that God has given to man is not the mere proclamation of the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son, but reconciliation to His living person. He died, he was buried, he rose again, and he lives. This message of the gospel, this pronouncement of his love, exemplified in his death and the cross of his son, is the means by which man is reconciled to the living person of Jesus Christ, who is alive today, who is in our very midst. Right now. The gospel message is for the purpose of reconciliation. And so, therefore, we have need to understand the person of Jesus Christ. The title of this message is The Incomprehensible Love of Jesus. Because though we are 2,000 years removed from this event of the cross, and though we can speak of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as an exemplification of His love, I am here to testify to you in his name as an ambassador of his kingdom and a student of his word and a man who has been saved by grace through faith in him that most of the people who profess to know him and believe in him, most of the people who confess to walk, believe in, experience his love have never known or comprehended the love of Jesus themselves. You see, friends, the cross was a violent execution device, and Jesus was a hated criminal of first century society. That means 
that Jesus Christ's life and ministry of love was so unpopular. It was so intolerable to man. It was so odious to their, their comprehension. It was so hard on their ears. It was so interruptive of their pleasures that they hated this man, Jesus, and they killed him. Very rarely will you hear a gospel message that labors to reconcile the death of God's Son on the cross to proclaim and make plain to the hearers that it was the intolerableness of His love to mankind that forced Him to the cross. That His love was not welcomed, it was not popular, it was not accepted. His love was hated. And as it was then, so it is now. So 1 John, I'm sorry, the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 5 speaks of this design of darkness, the incomprehending. It doesn't comprehend it. Darkness did not comprehend the light. Well, Jesus Christ speaks of this. I quoted John chapter 3, verse 16, but just a few verses down in verse 19, John chapter 3, verse 19, it is written that this is the condemnation Salvation, or the means thereof, is proclaimed in verse 16. Condemnation is proclaimed, or the reasons for condemnation are proclaimed in verse 19. John, John 3, verse 19. This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Jesus Christ, the embodiment of love, the sinless, incarnated person of God who preached nothing but love, was hated and crucified by the very people He came to save. And He gives the reason here, He says, the darkness didn't comprehend the light, and those who were in darkness hated the light and loved darkness instead. Christ is very bold to declare this is the condemnation. Yes, God so loved the world. That's unchangeable. That's indisputable. But this right here, this is the condemnation. That although light has come into the world, men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone, it says, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. Jesus Christ was this intolerable light. His love was odious to those who were fast bound in love to their sins. Jesus Christ was not friendly to sin. He was confrontational of it. He exposed it, condemned it, spoke of it in its true colors. While well, mankind justifies it and enjoys it and despised God's own Son. <coughs> to them, he seemed like a man of hate, a man of division, a man of controversy. A man of heresy. To them he did not seem like a man of love. John chapter 1 verse 10. It says he, that is Christ. He was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. They didn't understand him. 
They didn't know him. They didn't comprehend him, and they didn't like him. So my friends, what do you think about when you think of the love of Jesus? This is a very important question. Because you don't have to misunderstand. You don't have to go on as one never able to comprehend it. God in his mercy desires to open your eyes to understand his truth. All you need is a humble heart. All you need is a brokenness, a longing to hear what this wise and eternal creator has to say about his own son. The testimony is laid forth in his word. The testimony is clear and exhaustive and indisputable. You don't have to be in doubt, though a thousand denominations disagree. You don't have to be in doubt. You don't have to go on confounded about the love of Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, let me ask you a question. Who didn't comprehend the love of Jesus Christ in the first century? the Jews, his own people, his people that read, memorized the book that he gave them, his people that attended the synagogues and the temple regularly, his people that engaged in continuous ceremonies and rituals as prescribed by the, law, the letter of the law. His people that professed his name, the Jews, followers of the religion of Judaism, it was they who were in darkness. It was they who did not comprehend the light. It was they who crucified him. So this brings us now, 2,000 years removed from this situation, to consider deeply who, in fact, actually comprehends the love of God today. Because Satan infiltrated the religion of Judaism and preached poisonous messages of heresy from every single pulpit. Satan entirely infiltrated every single denomination of first century Judaism. Every single denomination, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes, the Herodians, every single denomination of Judaism with their various interpretations of Old Testament scripture were deluded from comprehending the light and love of Jesus Christ. Because of their iniquities. You see what is so important to understand is that things haven't changed today. We're looking at a situation 2,000 years ago, but it's only worse today. When the scripture says the darkness comprehended at night, he was speaking of the first century Christians, as it were. The first century Jews were in darkness. They comprehended it not. Those who went land and sea to evangelize the precepts of Judaism to preach of some Messiah as they understood it from the scriptures was a lie. They were in darkness. They didn't comprehend it. 
And what can be said of the whole Gentile world of the first century? They didn't comprehend it either. It says that Jesus came to his own, the Jews, and they knew him not. This is not, this situation, this enmity is not confined to any generation or culture. Just reading very quickly in the book of the Gospel of John, you'll find immediately that there is something very wrong. John the Baptist gives testimony in John chapter 2 verse 26, and he's preaching about the coming of Jesus Christ. And he says, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. There standeth one among you whom ye know not. The very Son of God himself. He's saying, in other words, you're in darkness. The light is here. The light is shining. You can't see it. And then in John chapter 2, John chapter 2, verse 13 through 25, very early in the Gospel of John, Jesus Christ enters into the temple. He finds it filled with iniquities and lawlessness, and he made a scourge with a few small cords, and he drove the sheep and the money changer tables. He flipped, and he drove all the workers of iniquity out of the temple, forcefully. And this is John chapter 2. This is before John 3.16. This is John chapter 2, 13 through 25. He cleanses the temple. The people respond to him. They say, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? John chapter 2 verse 18. And we know that the scripture says that a wicked and untoward generation seeketh after a sign. This was not a positive response. This was a scornful rejection of what was happening. They were offended that Jesus Christ did this. And Jesus Christ himself knew of the mischief in their hearts. It's written in John chapter 2, 24 through 25. It says that he did not commit himself to them. He knew all men. He needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That they could not be trusted. That they would kill him in the latter end. John chapter 3 opens up and bears witness of just how confounding and offensive Jesus Christ actually was. And one pastor comes to him named Nicodemus at night in secret, inquiring privately of Jesus what he's doing and why he's saying what he's saying and what it means. Utterly confused and confounded how such a man who so notoriously seems like a lawless man, Jesus Christ, a sinful man in their eyes, a hateful man, a divisive man. Why? This man, why are you doing this, Jesus? Why are you doing this? Nicodemus asks. And Jesus responds to him in paraphrase, and he says, Are you a pastor of Judaism and you don't know these things? And then Jesus Christ preaches John 3.16 through 21. The invasion of God's love into a world that is hostile against it. By John chapter 3.16, that is the context. It is the invasion of God's love in the embodiment of the Son of God, in the midst of a world that is at war against it. That's the context of John 3.16. This is why it behooved the Apostle John 
to declare verse 19 through 20, which I will speak again. It says, this is the condemnation. Don't let anybody be in doubt. This is the first century situation. This is the reason for all the enmity and all the confusion and all the division. That light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 16, teach us that this is not confined to any culture. This was not simply a problem with the Jews. This is a problem with all men. The enmity, the conflict of the Jews and Jesus Christ in the first century is not confined to any culture. It pervades every culture, including America. It pervades every culture, every nation, every people. So Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, who were of the nation of Thessalonica, said this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, this cause we thank God that the word of God has come to you. He says, verse 14, and that ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and, uh, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. They please not God in our contrary to all men. So what does this mean? Well, Jesus Christ didn't, didn't die Eternally, He died and He rose again. He lives today. He said in Matthew chapter 28 to His disciples, whom He was commissioning into all the world, He said, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. The apostles brought the gospel to the nation of Thessalonica. The apostle Paul preached the word of God. People were being converted. And he's commending the Thessalonians in this chapter. And he says, brethren of the Thessalonians, Christians, he says the same thing that happened in Israel, the same hostility, the same enmity, the same difficulty, the same persecution, the same situation that happened in Israel is now happening among you in the nation of Thessalonica. And you, brethren, beloved brethren of the Thessalonians, and he's commending them, he's praising God that you receive the word of God and you've become followers of the true Christians and the true Jews of the, the Jewish nation who actually believed and followed the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Haiti, crucified. So you see here by this report of Scripture that this is not confined to culture. This pervades every culture. It's not confined to a nation. It pervades every nation. The gospel and the person of Jesus and the love of God is hostile to every nation of the earth, just as it was hostile to every nation of the first century. This is the emphatic testimony of Scripture. You will not find any other report or any other doctrine, not in this book. So Paul, writing to the Corinthians, Writing to the Corinthians, who were of the nation of Corinth, who were Gentiles, who were converted, seeking to console them, seeking to comfort them, speaking of the difficulty of being a Christian, the hostility of the environment, and how the, the lost uh, countrymen of Corinth were turning against the saved Corinthians with the same wrath as the first century Jews. He says to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 31, he directly parallels the response of Jews and Gentiles alike in the same situation of the first century. He says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, that God has set himself at enmity against the wisdom of the whole world, both Jew and Gentile, and the Jews are responding in this way, and the Gentiles are responding this way, and finally, he gets to verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. He says, brethren, 
He's telling them, he's testifying to them, don't forget this, brethren. There are not many wise among you. There are not many noble that God has called and saved that are among you. He says, look amongst yourself, Corinthian Christians. There are many uh, doctors and lawyers and academics. There are many wise men and rich men and noble men among you. Not many. There are few, but not many. Why? What is, what is he saying? What is Paul saying? Why was the culture and the learning and the wisdom and the repute of the nation of Corinth antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, verse 27, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God hath chosen the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Amen. That is the answer. That's the explanation. This is not something you can, you, you need to be in doubt about. This is the direct, proclaimed intention and purpose of Almighty God to hide, mysteriously veil the truth from those who are unwaveringly trusting in their own wisdom, of their own culture, of their own nation, of their own people, and of their own selves, instead of the wisdom of God, which is foolishness to the world. This is not confined to any nation. We see it with the Thessalonians, we see it with the Corinthians, we see it with the first century Jews. This antagonistic relationship between God and unsaved man is unchangeable until salvation, until reconciliation. This is not confined to culture, neither is it confined to any generation. We cannot, as 21st century civilized American, westernized, learned, 21st century individuals look back at the idolatry-ridden Gentile world and scoff them and mock them and say, if I was in their day, I wouldn't have done what they've done because we have our own idols today. Sure, we have graduated from actually fashioning wood and stone together and falling down and worshiping it Sure, we have, but we fashion in the idolatry of our own intelligence, gods that suit our own selves. We call them any name we want. It could be Jesus, it could be the New Age Jesus, it could be the Enlightenment Jesus of the past, it could be the psychology Jesus, it could be all kinds of Jesus, the Catholic Jesus, where they worship him in a wafer, in a frame, every Sunday. It could be whatever Jesus you want. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus of the Bible has the same effect on American civilization as he did on Thessalonian civilization and Corinthian and Israelite civilization. That's the emphatic testimony we've been studying thus far. We see it here again in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. That is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. It speaks that. From the first century, 2,000 removed, 2,000 years removed from that now, from the first century to now, things will not get better. They will get worse. We cannot look back at the first century and say, things are different now. Sure, that's how they were. That's not how we are now. Sure, the Jews were in darkness, but the Christians today are in darkness. Sure, the Thessalonians and the Corinthians were in darkness, but... You know, the Americans aren't in darkness, the Europeans aren't in darkness, the Australians aren't in darkness. <clears throat> the things have changed now. Everybody accepts that Jesus is the Messiah in general. They respect him. It's not the same. Well, they respected him 
in various ways in the first century too. But his love was so bold and confrontational. His doctrines were so, so thwarting of human desire and wisdom that they couldn't tolerate him long. And so people read through the Bible and conveniently admire passages about him that are acceptable to them. And omit from their memory all the passages that are unacceptable to them. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. It says, in know also. It says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Written in the first century. He's pointing onward, down the calendar of time. He's saying, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And what is he going to say? He says, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Verse 2. They'll be covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, or the lovers of God, having a form of godliness. That means professing to be Christian, having a form of godliness, and denying the power thereof. From such turn away. This is the Apostle Paul writing. The man who's been stoned and left for dead. The man who's been beaten by 39 stripes twice, but brought to the brink of death. The man who was notoriously hunted all throughout the Gentile world was finally arrested in Israel by the Jews after they tried to beat him to death. And he's pointing down the calendar of time and he's saying, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. But people today look back and they say, oh, that's a perilous time. Paul looked forward and he says, perilous times are coming. Perilous times are coming. That means that it is a great deception to think that American culture, learning, wisdom, and civilization is somehow friendly to the gospel and person and love of Jesus Christ. It's completely contrary to the testimony of Scripture. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 12, bears another testimony. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 12. And what is spoken of there is a proclamation of how horrendous, how dark, how evil the last days shall be. It says that Satan will employ all deceivableness of unrighteousness. That is... The most deceptive powers that one cannot even comprehend how evil and how per pervasive and deceptive Satan shall be. In verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And it says, verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So if there is something notably different about the last days from all former days it is that God himself is going to give power to the devil so that the devil has liberty to deceive the whole world like the world has never been deceived before and that the result of that 
no doubt through a multitude of religious convictions and denominations, exactly like the first century, taking over, hijacking the pulpits of Christianity, just like Satan hijacked the pulpits of Judaism, overcoming all that is known to be truthful, reasonable, righteous, religious, Honorable and wise, de the devil himself. And it says that they will believe lies because they had pleasure in sin. So, again, these verses that I have just cited and referenced and read and expounded are for the purpose that we might realize that the first century hostility to the love of Jesus cannot be confined to that generation, nor to that nation, or people, or culture. This hostility pervades every nation, people, and culture, and much more of the last days. Much more. That's the indisputable testimony of Scripture. So the title of this message is The Incomprehensible Love of Jesus. It's incomprehensible today. Just as it was in the first century. So the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17, gives... A solemn warning. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. He says, love not the world. He says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Why does he say love not the world? Because the world doesn't love Jesus. Jesus Christ loves the people of the world. But the cultures, the nations, the peoples, the religions, the wisdom, the nobility of the world doesn't love Jesus. Therefore, John said, the darkness comprehended it not. And so John is giving a cry, he's giving a plea. He, he would gladly preach to them the gospel. He would gladly de declare to them the merits of the blood of Jesus. He would gladly declare to them all the glories of knowing God for all eternity in the bliss of heaven. But right here he says, love not the world. Because that is the course of deception. That is... The poison that will bring you all the way down into the pits of hell. The lust of the eyes. What your eyes desire to see. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. That pervades every culture. 